Gospel this morning as we begin, uh, continue our study in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to John 15, 18. We'll read to the end of the chapter. Let's stand as we pay honor to God's Word, and we'll look at this text this morning. Jesus says very clearly to his disciples, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours, also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If they had not come, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Thank you. You may be seated. How many of you here this morning like it or are encouraged when... People keep information from you that would be beneficial for your understanding. In other words, they gloss things over. They make things paint a rosier picture, a rosy picture, because they don't really want you to know the whole story. They're afraid that if they really tell you the whole story, you'll walk out the door. You'll say, I'm not sure I'm in for this. I'm not sure I like that. Because I have to say, there's a lot of preaching today in a lot of churches that are afraid to present certain passages of Scripture to the people who are sitting before them. Because they're afraid that if people hear this, they might say, um, I'm not so sure about this Christianity stuff. I'm not so sure about this following Jesus stuff. Because I'm not sure that's really what I'm in for when I, when I think of Christianity. But one of the things you realize about the Lord Jesus Christ as He prepares His disciples for ministry and life on this earth with Jesus in heaven and the Holy Spirit living in them is that Jesus doesn't withhold any information that He doesn't think is extremely valuable for His disciples to hear, even if that information might be a little troubling to hear because it creates a picture that is far less maybe rosy and optimistic maybe as, as the disciples might have been looking forward to. And you know what I'm talking about as we just read John chapter 15 starting with verse 18. It would be so easy for any pastor in a series of messages in the Gospel of John to just sort of skip by this passage. This is not easy stuff. But it's the truth. Right? It's the truth. And it's better we know the truth now than to have the truth glossed over, to have a picture of non-reality potentially painted for us, and then to face it head on, completely unaware of what we are about to face. Right? So I believe in living in reality. Not in some utopian sort of ethereal picture of, of life that's, that's, that's often painted 
to people living in prosperous nations with wealth and material blessings that everything is just going to be great and grand because you're a Christian. In fact, as I was preparing those who were going to be baptized, I don't know if I said it to all of them, but I, I'm going to tell them right now, is once you step in that water and you go public with Jesus, guess what? There's going to be trial and adversity and difficulty that come to your life. Because you're willing to make a stand for Jesus. And so as we look at John chapter 15, verse 18, we see how Jesus is training or equipping His disciples. And He told them the things they needed to know before He left for heaven. And as He told them the the things that He wanted them to know about what they would experience as He was going to heaven, one of the major things Jesus let them know is, your lives are not over because I'm going to heaven, because I'm leaving here. In fact, your lives are just beginning. Some of the greatest adventures, some of the greatest excitement lays, lie ahead in your future. So don't get discouraged. Don't worry. Don't fret about these, these things that are going to, to happen in the future. Your best life is going to start working. You're going to see some of the greatest things happen that's why jesus said that they would do some of the same works and even greater works than he did because jesus went to the father and so jesus is preparing his disciples for really some very significant experiences in their life he told them that life would come to experience new meaning as they would become ambassadors the first ambassadors for the kingdom of heaven on earth They would be representatives for the kingdom of heaven on earth, seeking to win, to gain, those who would engage through faith to enjoin themselves in salvation through Jesus Christ and develop that citizenship for themselves in the eternal kingdom of God, just like the disciples. So, in their role as witnesses, as ambassadors, Jesus told them, The only way this is going to work is you're going to have to abide in me, right? Abide in me. And let my words abide in you. He says, you're going to have to draw from the life of the Holy Spirit living in you to be the resource, the strength, the help that you will need to accomplish this mission that I have for you. And so in preparing the disciples for their future ministry, Jesus warned them very clearly. He didn't mince words. He didn't gloss this over. He said, disciples, you're going to face adversity in this world. And he delivers this message. When you seek to live out the new life, the life in the Spirit, the life of a saved person, the life of a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to face some adversity. You have the potential to face that. Now, as we look at John chapter 15, verse 18, we see that Jesus was being very candid with his disciples about their future. He covered all the bases with them. He's not painting some unrealistic picture with them. He didn't want them to be caught off guard in the days to come, so he reveals to them that their connection with Jesus would subject them to the similar treatment that Jesus experienced. Okay? As they connected and identified with Jesus Christ, he said, guys, gals, disciples, followers, whoever you are, you can expect to receive the same kind of treatment in this world that I did. Right? He says in the text, a servant isn't greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? Maybe not the most exciting passage of Scripture to read, right? When you think about persecution. Because persecution means, obviously, a relational kind of conflict is going to ensue between Christ's followers and people in the world. And having said that, some of the greatest persecution that Jesus received was from church people. 
right? Who were his greatest detractors? Who were his greatest enemies? Who were the ones that were always dogging him, always seeking to trip him up, always seeking, and in the end were somewhat, uh, you know, a part of this, this effort, although they really didn't do it. I mean, uh, Jesus willfully gave himself over to death because he came to die for sinners, but we see it was the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the church people. They were the, 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 the most staunchest persecutors and those who were certainly um, after Jesus and fighting what he was attempting to do. So persecution is a very common theme that is continued throughout the teaching of the New Testament. Disciples of Jesus Christ can expect to face harassment, trial, adversity, all of this in the world because they have a close connection with Jesus Christ. If you diligently seek to live the Christian life, to live the life of a disciple of Jesus, you can expect some of your friendships might change. Some of your business relationships might change. Some of your family relationships might change. People may not embrace your Christianity, your discipleship with great excitement. We learn this in also in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 12, where it says, everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Now on Wednesday night, Dr. Jeremiah brought out, it's not those who are necessarily just living a godly life in Christ Jesus that are persecuted. It's those who desire to do that. All it takes is the desire to live a godly life in Christ. It says they can expect some form of resistance in this world from attempting or desiring to do that. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12 says, Don't be surprised at the fiery trials that, are going, that you're going through as if something strange was happening to you. Peter knew it wasn't strange to face persecution and adversity because of following Jesus Christ. So Jesus and the Holy Spirit through the author John prepared in advance the Christian church for the experience of persecution in this text. Very clear message. Now, addressing the subject of persecution in America can be difficult. And it's difficult because it's very it may not be something that we can relate to very easily. We've never suffered for our faith to the extent, perhaps, that others in other parts of the world have suffered for identifying with Christ. We don't suffer like believers in China where they can't go to a public assembly like we are experiencing today. They have to go underground. Their churches have to be uh, very much conducted in secrecy. And in other parts of the world where Muslim influence is very strong, those who are very strong Christians, whether it's in Iran or Iraq or Afghanistan or in other parts of the world where there is great hostility towards Christianity, they know what persecution is all about. They, they know what adversity is about. They know what it's like to be targeted and to know that any moment that when you're worshiping, someone could knock on the door, or that the door could be broken down, and police officials could come in and arrest you, if not even put you to death because of what you're doing. We don't know what that's like. And so, since we haven't suffered persecution, it'd be really easy to say, why do, we need to, why do we need to look at a passage like this? I mean, our, our nation was, was founded with religious freedom as one of its hallmark principles. And because of it, and because of God's providence, we, are not, we haven't experienced any degree or significant degree of suffering in our day for following Jesus Christ. Yet, we all know, don't we? If, you, if you've been watching the news, the climate in America is changing. 
the attitude that people are of the world are beginning to develop against those who want to uphold God's moral principles, God's moral absolutes, um, there is some persecution. There is some trial. If you want to stand for Jesus. And so we need to be alert to these things because the times are changing. And we need to be aware of what God tells us, what God encourages us in His Word as we look at that. So, as we look at John chapter 15, verses 18 through 21, I want to suggest Jesus is providing us two very important pieces of wisdom for our journey as followers of Jesus Christ. Two very important pieces of wisdom that we need to know about persecution. First of all, the first bit of wisdom that Jesus gives us in His Word is there is no middle ground. I, want to, I just want to say that. There is no middle ground. And what I mean by that. You are either living your life identifying with Jesus and a follower of Him, or you are identifying with the world living in opposition to Christ. Jesus doesn't give a middle option. That I can be a blend. I can be a worldly disciple. That I can walk a very fine line, a fence that's drawn between what is Christian and what is worldly. What is of being a disciple of Jesus and what is the world. Okay? Jesus says there is no middle ground. Okay? And so the language of the text, like other texts of the New Testament, confirms very straightforwardly this fact, there is no middle ground. There is not a safe zone where a disciple can sort of comfortably operate with the world to avoid persecution. Okay? That zone is constructed or manufactured by deceived, carnal, or perhaps not even saved, but just religiously oriented people for their own comfort, for their own ease. Okay? Jesus says, if you were of this world, the world would love you. Right? If you were of the world, the world would love you. Case in point. If you went to some bar on some Friday night, and you wanted to be of this world, and you just started engaging in the activities, the conversation, the, 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 the alcohol consumption, and lived it up, guess what? You would be welcomed in any one of those places. But if you walked into that place and started praying over your Diet Coke and had conversations with people about Jesus, you might find out that the world may not be so accepting of you. It's like, could you do that somewhere else? This is where we hang out. Go to that place of Christ. Isn't that what that Discovery Church does across the street? Jesus says that. If you were of the world, the world would love you. But you are not of the world, right? Jesus says that. That's, that's a mark of identification for a disciple. You're not of this world, right? And I, w I went back to the past, a blast from the past, right? To Petra. Now, if you, if you were, grew up in the 80s, you knew who Petra was. Actually, probably the late 70s. Like, they were a group that sang, and they sang this strong. You are strangers. You are aliens. You are not of this world. It's a great song. Look it up on YouTube. The words are powerful. I wanted to show it today. But I, 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 I mean, it was, it was just like this was back in the early 80s. This group had come out of hardcore rock and roll music, got saved, and found out, wow, when you give your life to Jesus, there's no acceptance in this world. We're strangers. We're aliens. We're not of this world. People that we used to have friendships with, they don't want to be friends with us anymore because we're talking about Jesus. We're talking about life, and they just don't want to hear about that. They want to live in this sort of death, sort of plagued planet 
where it's all about self-fulfillment and self-indulgence and everything else. But you are not of the world because I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. I love that. Jesus said, I chose you out of the world. Jesus chose them, right? Jesus chose us, if you're a believer, out of this world. And you live the kind of life because you've been chosen out of the world that will potentially encounter persecution because it conflicts with the world system. When you live a clear, sincere, uncompromised, or a, a life of not compromising the principles of discipleship and following Jesus Christ that's lived before others, you're going to face some tension. Jesus is saying that. Why? Because the world and Jesus are opposite. That's why Jesus came into the world to save the world, right? He came to rescue the world. Why? Because the world isn't a good place. It is, the world is dying. The world is, this is, the world is suffering under the curse of sin. People are dying, and they go into graves, and they have no hope. And the God of this universe doesn't want people in that predicament. So he comes in to this worldly system under the power, under the dominion and domain, under the, the, the temporary rule of Satan who holds people under his grips by deception, making them believe that they're their own gods. Just like he said to Adam and Eve, you can become your own gods. Just follow my plan. Don't follow God's plan of obedience. Follow my plan, self-fulfillment. Eat it up, right? And Satan's invitation is an invitation to bondage, not freedom, not life, not enjoyment of God in his presence for others. So Jesus and the world are opposites. The world refers to the operating system that is under the direction and control of Satan that works in this world that is in opposition to God, His glory, and His character. It is the dominion of darkness. It's where evil is. It's where, where rebellion is. And everything that stands contrary to God is here in this world. And I believe one of the greatest deceptive victories in the lives of many people is Satan convincing them and providing them the assurance or the feeling that there's some kind of a, a middle ground that exists where you don't have to be really, really kind of all-out Christian, and you just don't have to be really all-out worldly. You can just be somewhere in the middle. So I'm going to stop at the sermon just a minute because I just saw something, and I feel really bad. Brian and Teresa, congratulations. I don't know. They're probably going to feel bad that I said this, but they got married a couple weeks ago, and, and I was celebrating everything else today, and so I want to celebrate that too. So my bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How that fits with anything, but I'm just so grateful. I remembered it, so thank you. All right. So we're not completely worldly, you know? That's that deception. That's, we, we don't want to be completely worldly, uh, but we're not going to be really devout disciples. Because you know what happens when you're a devout disciple? You make some choices in life to live a different way. You're not going to embrace certain things that are embraced in the world. You're going to embrace what God teaches in His Word, and you know that that is kind of, when you read what God's Word is and you see what's operating in the world, you see that it's, it's, it's going in different directions. Okay? And so the devil has kind of sold that idea that there's this middle ground that exists, right? There's this ground where you really can't distinguish... Where you're walking. Are you with Christ or with the world? When it's Sunday, it's pretty obvious. It seems like they're all with Christ. But when they walk out of here on Monday and they start talking and they, they start communicating, and they start thinking, and they start getting on their computers and they, they start, you know, their relationships with other people, then, then we're not quite sure. That's the middle ground that Satan wants to create. Where people can feel just comfortable. That you can do this church thing on Sunday, and then, then Monday through the rest of the week, you can kind of do your worldly thing, and, that, and that's just okay. There's plenty of room to operate 
between being a radical Christian and a pagan worldly person. And I hope you've seen, as you've lived your life, that this little, fine little path has grown. This middle ground has grown in our society. It's grown quite a bit. It's gotten wider so that, so that a lot of times you really can't tell the difference between a Christian who calls himself a Christian and someone who's worldly, other than they show up at church on Sunday sometimes. And this whole idea has, has been certainly fostered by this movement called tolerance and political correctness. Where you can't say anything. You can't offend anybody. You can't call sin, sin. You can't, because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Don't get me wrong. But I am committed to saying God's feelings about stuff. And if people's feelings are hurt by God's feelings, then we need to take notice of that. If my feelings get hurt by God's feelings, I need to take notice of that. Maybe there's a reason for that, and it, I need to repent. I need to acknowledge my sin and say, I want to do it God's way. And we've seen in our day how even in churches, there's been a movement toward looser interpretations of Scripture that are soft on sin, that are more politically correct in their framework and thinking, focused on less on the issue of sin and, and, and less on God's call to righteous, holy, and godly living and cheapening the whole concept of grace. But if you look in your Bibles at Jude chapter 1, um, you'll notice that um, the author Jude, uh, uh, one of the the brothers of Jesus, noticed he, he says with great warning in Jude chapter 1, verse 3, Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I really wanted to talk to you about our salvation that we enjoy with Jesus, because that's such a much more pleasant subject, right? Talking about salvation. He said, that's really why I wanted to write this book, but I couldn't. Why couldn't I? Because I found it necessary to write appealing you to contend for the faith, earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept unnoticed who long ago were destined for condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master, the Lord Jesus Christ. They pervert the grace of God. You know, I've noticed in my day, in my age, as I've grown up in the church, the message of grace, 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 grace has, has come on. And I'm not saying all of that was necessarily bad, but I'm saying in some of that teaching, grace is almost the excuse now to live it up however you want because grace covers it all. But if you go to Romans chapter 6, it says you can't do that. Are we to sin more? That God will get more of God's grace? Paul says, heavens, no. Grace, grace is about inspiring people and teaching people to live holy, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14 encourages that. The grace of God that appears to all men. It, it teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Grace isn't sort of that free pass for Christians to go out and live it up and say, I'm covered by grace. Isn't that wonderful? Heavens, no. If you remember in Revelation chapter 3, there was a church. It's the last church. It's the church of Laodicea. The word laos means it was the church of the people. And it's quite obviously in that church of the people meant we are proud. We, we, we're, 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 pretty, we're pretty excited about, about the, the keys to the car that we own outside. We're rich. We're, 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 we're really digging this life. We're, we're really making it for ourselves. And Jesus says, you're miserable, you're poor, and you're blind. He says, you're lukewarm. I can't tell if you're hot or cold. I can't tell if you're of Jesus or if you're of the world because you're somewhere in the middle. And because of it, 
It repulses me so much I want to spit you out of my mouth. That, that, is, that is something, you know, you look at and you kind of go, wow, Jesus isn't excited about this church because they're blinded by their pride and their self-sufficiency. They're blinded by their wealth and their accomplishments that they can't see that it has darkened their understanding of who they are and who they're committed to, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they're kind of living this worldly, comfortable experience. You see, people in this condition really don't get much persecution as much as they may be subject to God's discipline. For not walking true in the faith. The world system is very strong. It's very appealing. It wants you to believe that you can be a part of it. And a part of God's. Kingdom at the same time. But Jesus says they're opposites. There is no melding together. Of the world. And being of Christ. And whoever would do it, they're doing it on their own. It's not that they're given permission by Scripture or by God to be able to do this. James, another brother of Jesus, was very strong when he said he called people spiritual adulteresses. He says people who call friendship with the world, people who have a friendship with the world are are hostile. They're enemies of God. That's scary. But that just says there's a natural desire because when we identify with Christ, we don't want to fully identify with Him because it's hard, hard to, to, to think about that that might separate me from some of my close friends. For me to live as Christ might make things uncomfortable, might have to change some of the conversations, might have to even at times cause me maybe that I have to get up and walk out of something because it's not edifying, it's not what it needs to be for me in my spiritual life. And rather than just joining in, I make a stand and say, you know what? I'm a follower of Jesus. You can laugh at me. You can mock me. You can say whatever you want to. But I know whom I believed. I've accepted Jesus. And I'm following Him. And there is a distinct difference between following Him and walking in this world and under the worldly uh, seduction and pull and enslavement. And I'm willing to do that. We all all struggle with that, don't we? That, That is the hardest thing. To not get somewhat thrown into the middle. Kids, it's the hardest thing for you in your schools to, 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 to not get thrown in the middle, to be this kid that comes to youth group on, on Wednesday and then, whoom, you know, during the week we're right here. Because that's where our friends want us to be. That's where our friends will allow us to be. That's where it's the most comfortable to be with our friends is, whom somewhere in the middle so no one can really tell that we belong to Jesus or we don't belong to Jesus. And you know what it's like on your job site. How easy it is for the language of that job to become your language the minute you walk in the door because boom, it's just so much easy to operate there. I'm not saying this is easy stuff. I'm not saying it's easy sometimes to live out your testimony, your faith in Jesus Christ. But don't be surprised that it's happening because Jesus said it would happen. If you identify with me, if you've been chosen out of the world, the world is going to hate you because it hated me. And folks, I think the hatred of the world toward those who follow Christ is going to get stronger as the days move on. And it's really going to separate, again, the, the, the line that's been created. I really believe that. Because the world is going to really want people, especially if we get into the, the, the religion of the Antichrist, 
and the one world religious community, that is going to be where the separation takes place. Will you stand for Jesus or will you stand for this wishy-washy, whatever worldly system of tolerance, political correctness, all roads lead to heaven. It doesn't matter what you believe because whatever you believe is going to get you there somewhere. There are so many people espousing to that. This universalism that, that there is no hell, that God would never ever do something like that. And yet, there's still evil in this world, is there not? Where does that evil come from? Where is that evil? What is that evil about? What is the source of this evil? The politically correct, the tolerance people don't want to address the evil. What is the source of this evil that's in the heart of people? And what can change that? Only Jesus Christ. You know, I believe through Christian apathy and indifference and not wanting to make waves, we've seen moral values and things start to change in our time. And I don't know about you, but it just seems like we're feeling more helpless in our desire to see moral and spiritual reform in our society. It's just not going to happen. It doesn't seem like it's going to happen. It just seems like the train left the station and it, it's picking up steam. And we're going, wait, wait. That's, that's, not, that's leading to disaster. We don't want it to go that direction. But it's almost too late. So I think we need to consider the wisdom of Jesus very clearly here. Am I fully committed to Jesus Christ? Do you really believe that Jesus chose you out of this world? Notice he said he chose you out of this world. He pulled you out of. He rescued you from the dominion of darkness. There is a separation that took place when you were saved. That separation was separating from the darkness to the light. And the challenge is to live out that separation in the power of the Holy Spirit, in abiding with Jesus Christ, because there's always a pull to bring you back. But if we want to be fruitful and abide, if we want to see our lives make a difference, in the lives of other people, and bear fruit, we have to maintain that separation. And God's Word has given us the, the instruction how we can maintain this separation, not in a haughty and proudful, prideful and sort of get in your face kind of way, but we can do it in a very loving and gracious way to people who are lost. When I'm with lost people, the last thing I want to express to them is a sense that I that that when I'm in their presence, they feel like they're condemned. I want them to know that they are loved. They are loved with an everlasting love. But they need to come experience the power of that love to change their life. And maybe you do as well. That's the love of Jesus Christ. That's the love of a Savior who gave up His life to die for us. That's, that's the love of God in Jesus Christ. And that's what we've embraced. And that love has transformed, transformed us. It's taken us out of this world into the kingdom of the Son He loves. It's an eternal kingdom where when we die, the pastor can say it gladly at our funerals, hey, He just, he just left this, this planet for, to claim His citizenship in heaven. Because we believe there is a heaven. Because God says there's a heaven. God says there's an eternal life and we believe it. Because think of this. If someone wanted to take your life, if life got so bad in this country that to be a Christian would require you to give up your life, 
if you recanted on your Christianity, what kind of life do you think you would experience after that? If it's come to that. Knowing we're all going to die someday, wouldn't you want to do it knowing that you died standing for the one you are counting on to save you from this world? I'm just half done, and I'm going to stop. Because I think it's, that's probably enough today, isn't it? To chew on, right? I know this isn't easy stuff. This isn't Christian life. This isn't, this isn't that sort of sweet message we walk home going, hey, yeah, I feel good about life today. It, it, it's the reality. It's the truth. Jesus said... I mean, I don't like it. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. I'm that guy that likes everybody to like me. Don't you like people to like you? And that's a scary thing, because when you want people to like you, it's so easy to get gravitationally pulled to the middle. And even pastors struggle sometimes to stand up and say, you know what, I'm just not in on that. There's a lot of stuff that I, that, I have, that I have to encounter when I'm out in the world with people that I hear jokes that I should be saying, uh, you shouldn't be saying that. I just don't say anything. My spirit's grieved at what's going on, but I just don't say anything. Because what are they going to do if he say something? <clears throat> I mean, how many per people, it's amazing, how many people apologize to me for using God's name in vain? I'm not God. I don't like it, but God doesn't like it any. God, God likes it. He doesn't like it. I mean, it's worse with Him. But it's like, somehow, I'm God? No, I don't like it when you use God's name in vain. But, that's, I pray for you that you'll have freedom over that, but God doesn't like it either. And how many people have I said that to? How many people have I confronted in a loving way to say, hey, wait a second. I'm just not with that kind of joke. You told the dirty joke on the job and just say, uh, I didn't think that was all that funny. Are we standing for Jesus? Or could we honestly admit today we've gotten pulled to the middle thinking there is a middle when there really isn't? Today it's the day to make a stand and say, Jesus, I thank You that You have chosen me out of the world. And because of that, I know that I've been chosen out of the world. I may face some persecution. I may face some, some hatred from people because I've been chosen out of the world. And I'm willing to embrace that. I'm willing to embrace suffering as a follower of Jesus Christ because I belong to Jesus. I love Jesus. I'm a citizen of heaven, not of this world. My, my home is not here. My home is up there, and I'm just here for a while to represent that home until Jesus takes me home, and I'm going to live for Jesus. And that's what I want you to think about this morning. There is no middle ground. And if there is, we've created it. God didn't create it. And if we've somehow been gravitationally pulled to the middle ground, today you can move back. Because with God, there's always grace and forgiveness to move in the right direction. There's always forgiveness. There's always hope. There's always strength in Jesus Christ to say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I've given in. And more than likely, when we give in, we're not abiding, right? We're not abiding. When we're abiding with Christ and He's abiding in us, we have that strength to send. It's when we, when we get, get off the track of, 
abiding in His Word and letting it abide in us, that's when we get tempted and that's when it's easy to just get sucked in to a middle that doesn't exist, but that we like to believe it exists because it's just an easier ride for us. Is it time to say, I don't want the easy ride in life. I just want to ride with Jesus. If that's your desire, will you tell Jesus that this morning, however you want to do that? If you want to do it by coming up and praying about it, if you want to do it just by standing in your seat or sitting in your seat and praying, Jesus, I want to ride with you today. Whatever it is, if you want Christ to be the Savior and Lord of your life, would you, would you express that? We're going to play just a song. It's real short. I want you to think about this message and what God has spoken to you about. What has He convicted you about? What has He stimulated? Are you willing to be persecuted for Jesus, your Savior?